Commanding the mission, Air Force Colonel Frank Borman. He's been in space once before, making the 14-day Gemini 7 mission three years ago. Borman is 40, married, and has two teenage sons. Number two man in the spacecraft, Navy Captain James Lovell. He was Borman's co-pilot on Gemini 7, and then commanded Gemini 12. He has spent 425 hours in space, more than any other human. And after Apollo 8, well, by himself, have spent more time in space than all of the Soviet Union's cosmonauts. He is 40, married, and has four children, two boys and two girls. The third man up is Air Force Major William Anders, a rookie. This flight to the moon, his first trip into space. Anders is 35, married, and has five children, four boys and a girl. Their mission is the most difficult ever attempted and the most dangerous. They start with man's first ride aboard that 36-story Saturn V. Two other Saturn Vs have been launched successfully, and the rocket now is judged ready to carry men. From the launch pad into orbit, 11 and a half minutes, ending with Apollo 8 still connected to its third stage. It will stay in Earth orbit for almost two revolutions while the crew makes sure that everything is working satisfactorily. Then, almost three hours after liftoff, near Hawaii, the third stage engine will be restarted, driving Apollo 8 out of its Earth orbit and onto a course for the moon. If the engine fails, or some fault in Apollo 8 itself causes mission controllers to call off the try for the moon, the spacecraft will spend up to 10 days circling the Earth. But if that engine works properly, Borman, Lovell, and Anders are on the way toward their rendezvous with the moon, crossing some 230,000 miles of space in 66 hours, making minor course corrections if needed on the way. Then, 69 hours after launch, Apollo 8 will be just 70 miles from the moon. At this point, its rocket engine will be fired, slowing it for lunar orbit just before 5 a.m. next Tuesday morning, the day before Christmas. During this critical maneuver, the spacecraft is behind the moon, not in contact with mission control here on Earth. And so it won't be known for almost 20 minutes if the engine started, if it fired long enough, and if Apollo 8 is indeed in orbit around the moon. If the engine doesn't start, or if the astronauts uh, detect something wrong and elect not to start it, they merely will swing around the moon and start back to Earth. If it does work, the astronauts will start up to 20 hours in moon orbit, circling the moon once every two hours at 3,700 miles an hour. Their first two orbits will be egg-shaped, and then on the third, the orbit will be made circular, 70 miles high. And take hundreds of photographs and motion pictures, concentrating on areas where future Apollo astronauts plan to land. Early Christmas morning, the most critical maneuver will take place. Apollo's rocket engine will be restarted in order to take the astronauts out of lunar orbit and start them back toward Earth. Now that maneuver, like the one that put them into orbit, will be done while the spacecraft is behind the moon, out of contact with Earth. So it won't be until Apollo 8 races back around the moon that we will know if the engine worked perfectly and that the crew is indeed on the way back home. If that rocket fails, the men will be trapped in moon orbit as surely as would earlier astronauts have been trapped in Earth orbit if their retro rockets had failed. Once started back, the return flight will take 58 hours. During that time, several mid-course corrections may be made to make sure that Apollo 8 enters the atmosphere at the correct and the critically precise angle. If it comes in too steeply, the sudden breaking against the atmosphere could crush the astronauts. Or if the approach is too shallow, the spacecraft will skip off the atmosphere like a stone off water, go back into space, and the astronauts will be lost. After a successful entry into the atmosphere that speeds up to 25,000 miles an hour when temperatures on the heat shield will get up to 4,000 degrees, next Friday, six days after liftoff, the spacecraft will drop into the Pacific Ocean 1,000 miles from Hawaii. And appropriately enough, the nearest spot of land will be Christmas Island. Thing is go for this flight. If I could very quickly show you the magnitude of this flight, I'd like to do that. If I could give a warning to... Uh, to my uh, stalwart director, uh, Freddie Stolmack, down below here somewhere, I'd like to show you something. Over here on this globe of the moon, of the Earth, man, in the highest he's ever been off the surface of the Earth, uh, in the flight of Gemini 11, 
was 850 miles high, and by the scale of this globe, that would be three quarters of an inch. Three quarters of an inch off of that surface. You could use this little model just to kind of show you that. Just that, three quarters of an inch. Now, if this were all in scale, this flight would be taking man this far. And I'm sorry, Freddie, I'm going right out of your lighting and everything else here because it goes, it would go 30 feet instead of three quarters of an inch, 30 feet out into space to reach the moon. What a flight. What a thing this flight of Apollo 8 will be. And what a remarkable achievement for the space program when you consider that we really got started only seven years ago with the flight of the first Mercury on a Redstone rocket. Vehicle created by the extremely low temperatures of the propellants. Coming up on 90 seconds, mark T minus 90 seconds and counting. The Apollo 8 uh, crew standing by, spacecraft commander Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, Bill Anders. We now have a report that the liquid hydrogen tank on the third stage is pressurized. One minute, 15 seconds. All third stage uh, propellants pressurized at this time as we come up on the 60 second mark on a flight to the moon. T minus 60 seconds and counting. T minus 60 seconds and counting. The vehicle now is completely pressurized. We're coming up on a power transfer shortly. T minus 50 seconds and counting. We have the power transfer. We're now on the flight batteries within the launch vehicle. 45 seconds, final reports coming from Frank Borman at this time. Final uh, look at the switch list aboard the spacecraft. 35 seconds and counting. We'll lead up to an ignition sequence start at 8.9 seconds. This will lead up as we build up the thrust to a liftoff. If all goes well, at zero. We've just passed the 25 second mark in the count. 20 seconds, all aspects. We are still go at this time. T minus 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9. We have ignition sequence start. The engines are armed. 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. We have commit. We have, we have put off. T1 AM Eastern Standard Time. Looks good. We have cleared the tower. Oh, and there's the rumble in our building. It looks good. It looks like a good flight. It's a beautiful takeoff so far. This building is shaking under us. Our camera platform is shaking. But what a beautiful flight. Man, perhaps on the way to the moon. If all continues to go well. Probably more severe than the men in the spacecraft itself. One minute and fifteen seconds, then we're a little more than half a mile into the sky and about uh, nearly four miles downrange. You're now hearing the voice of Paul Haney at Mission Control in Houston. And our great VU cameras are picking up the spacecraft. One minute for 40 seconds. All looks great. Now in 15 seconds, the inboard engine should cut off on that first stage. That's the one inboard engine and then six-tenths into the mission, and uh, Frank Borman has conver confirmed each event as it's been passed to him by Mike Collins at this point. The crew has been given a go for staging. Inboard out on time, Frank Borman says. In 25 the more seconds, engines. the other four engines of the first stage should cut out. Two minutes, 25 seconds. 
The rocket then will be 20 miles high and going 3,000 miles an hour. And there is the staging. We see staging. Uh, an S-1C, the first stage cutoff. S-2 has ignited, we can confirm. And the thrust looks good. All engines, all sources show the second stage is burning perfectly. Two they had their finger. 51 seconds into the mission. They Terry Drinkwater, uh, if you and Doc Shoemaker could point to these points on the uh, moon there as uh, they're being described, perhaps we'll get a graphic picture of it as we hear from Jim Lovell. Back up. Let's, uh, what we'll do is we'll take that tape again, Dr. Shoemaker. That was the end of that particular transmission. And we will uh, we'll take that tape again. And when we do, this time around, uh, we'll let you point to those spots on the moon. In about uh, 10 seconds, we'll be ready to go with that. I think Langren, this is the first uh, point that he okay, described. Here uh, he comes. Houston, the moon is essentially gray. <coughs> no color. Looks like plaster of Paris. Okay, or uh, sort of a grayish beach sand. We can see quite a bit of detail. Uh, the sea of fertility doesn't stand out as well here as it does back on Earth. There's not as much contrast between that and the surrounding craters. Uh, the equated craters are all rounded off. There's quite a few of them. Some of them are newer. Many of them look like, uh, especially the round ones, look like uh, hit by meteorites or projectiles of some sort. And that's the end of that uh, tape transmission. The uh, uh, passage around the moon, you know, is uh, the distance actually, uh, the circumference of the moon is about the same as the distance, I, as I recall, from New York to Berlin uh, going eastward uh, some uh, what is it, 2,600 miles, is it, Dr. Shoemaker? Yes. Uh, and that's about the distance from New York to Berlin. That's the entire circumference around the moon. Uh, those of you who might have wondered why it takes uh, two hours to orbit the moon at 70 miles high, and it takes uh, only an hour and a half to orbit the Earth, as we learned in Mercury and Gemini, from around 110 to 30 miles high. Well, the fact is that the orbital speed uh, is a factor of the mass of the body that you are orbiting. Uh, or you know, what we're saying is that it's a factor of gravity because mass determines the gravity. And the moon is, has one-sixth of the mass and therefore one-sixth of the gravity of Earth. The man on the moon will weigh one-sixth of what he weighs on Earth. When he walks along the moon, he'll actually bounce with giant strides because with the same amount of energy that he takes one three-foot step on Earth, he may take a 12-foot step on the moon. That's because of the gravity. Well, since uh, to get into orbit around a body, you have to balance gravity against speed, uh, it doesn't, you don't have to go so fast. To, uh, you can't go too fast around a body with less gravity or you'd fly away again. So the speed around the moon is around 3,600 miles an hour, and that takes two hours to get around. So the moon orbit will be two hours around rather than uh, around, uh, uh, around an hour and a half for Earth orbit. Incidentally, the, the uh, definition of the picture uh, in its outline was uh, determined by the spacecraft window through which they were shooting. Uh, one of the two rendezvous windows, which are shaped in that kind of uh, open pie shape uh, fashion, uh, the two flat sides and the round top. And that's what uh, you were seeing, the picture through the window framed 
by those windows. The spacecraft was facing straight down. I can show it to you here. The uh, spacecraft was actually tilted right straight down at the moon, and the photographs were being made through one of these rendezvous windows, through both of the windows at one time or another, uh, straight down at the, er, at the uh, moon. Perhaps we can uh, take a, another look at that in a moment or two.
let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning with the second day. <laughs> and God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called these seas. And God saw that it was good. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth.